Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Translation Born, the show where we talk all about translation, Bloodborne, and the translation of Bloodborne. As you can see, I'm starting out this time by muting all the in game audio except for that linked to the vocal performances. This is because I want to warp into the Vile Blood Queen's chamber to see what Alfred's been up to since we gave him that unopened summons, and the start of his dialogue can be hard to hear if the other sounds are on. Also, if you're not familiar, note that this scene can be pretty intense. Here we go. Master, look! I've done it! I've done it! I smashed and pounded and grounded this rotten siren into fleshy pink pulp! There, you filthy monstrosity! What good's your immortality now? Try stirring up trouble in this sorry state! All mangled and twisted, with every inside on the outside for all the world to see. <laughs> so, I don't know about you, but I've always found this moment quite disturbing, even though I also think it's extremely important. Before I get into that, though, or address what I consider an excellent translation, let's see if Alfred's calmed down any since I restored my audio settings. Are you feeling okay? <laughs> oh. oh, you, is it? Look at this. Thanks to you, I've done it. Well, isn't it wonderful? Now Master can be canonized as a true martyr. <laughs> I've done it. I have. <laughs> you seem real focused on that. Any other thoughts? <laughs> I've done it. I have. <laughs> okay, I'll just leave you to your gloating then. And uh, don't mind me while I go over here and uh, admire your handiwork. Now that I have the queenly flesh, though, I want to go back and look at the translation of Alfred's initial set of lines, because I think this bit of dialogue stands as a brilliant example of delivering on the underlying theme of the original without being bound to the literal wording. And this is important, since one of the effects of rendering this passage more literally would be to make Alfred sound considerably more misogynistic. In the original Japanese, right from the second line, when Alfred refers to Annalise using the phrase kegareta onna, his use of the term onna for woman has a decidedly crude connotation in this context. Then, in the next line, he literally calls her a whore, and when he later says now she won't be able to deceive anyone in her current state, he uses a term that can also be associated with seduction. Having established Alfred's misogyny, though, I think it's important that we stop and consider what all these insults are driving at, and what the basic theme of this questline is. Admittedly, this will necessarily involve some personal interpretation, but I want to dwell on this for a while because it ties in with a big part of what I like about the official translation. For my part, I think Alfred is meant to serve as a sort of parallel to our player character. In my mind, this goes back to the ruthless qualities required of a hunter that I've mentioned before. Remember, as gruesome as the scene is with Alfred standing in the throne room, our hunter has on numerous occasions been rained on by the splattering blood of various foes. Every time we've beaten a boss, we've gotten the message, Pray Slaughtered. Visceral attacks, which involve thrusting our hands into enemies' flesh to cause massive damage to their internal organs, are an ordinary part of gameplay. And it's not just the mechanics of combat in and of themselves that show how ruthless we can be. Whenever we obtain an item of some sentimental value, there's always a practical reason for us to basically ruin it. When we use the music box against Father Gascoigne, we're essentially weaponizing the last of his humanity by turning his struggle to regain himself into an opportunity to either attack him or better prepare ourselves to kill him. When we get items like Viola's Red Jewel brooch or the mysterious Tear Stone shed by the doll, we're encouraged to destroy these useless items in favor of gaining unique blood gems. Our character is always looking to gain an edge in the hunt, though as we know, the hunt itself can addict hunters with its seductive thrill. We've seen how old hunters can't forget the hunt, and we also know some hunting styles leverage the bestial pleasure of tearing through foes as a source of strength. Even beyond this sort of in-game evidence, though, I think there's often a similar thrill that players experience, 
a rush of joy and relief that comes after defeating a particularly hard boss. I know I've certainly felt that way. So when we see Alfred glorying in his victory, having gruesomely reduced Annalise to meat chunks, I can't help but see this moment as being meant to both disturb players and invite them to think about how similar our actions are. The only difference between us is what we recognize as prey, something Alfred actually mentions when he first meets us. The funny thing about Alfred is, as much as his change in demeanor works as a surprise, he's actually been honest all along about seeing the Vilebloods as inhuman prey to be stamped out. This brings us back at last to his first few lines in the throne room, because it's this sense of the Vilebloods being no better than vermin in Alfred's eyes, together with his perception of Annalise as a temptress, that I think explains his misogynistic language. It's also what the official translation is most true to when in the second line of the English, Alfred calls Annalise a siren, associating her with a female monster of myth famous for luring men to their doom. It's a reference that captures the essence of how Alfred sees Annalise in a single word. Furthermore, after he calls her a siren, shifting his insult from whore to monstrosity in the third line not only makes sense, as sirens are in fact monsters, it reinforces the idea that he sees her as less than human, worthy prey for a hunt. This of course also ties in well with the potential parallel between Alfred and the player character, because we are just as ruthlessly violent when fighting monstrous beasts. To summarize then, not only does the official translation hone in on what I see as the underlying intent behind the literal wording of Alfred's insults, it also strengthens his role as a mirror or foil for the player character. What's more, the dialogue at once sounds natural and appropriately disturbing for the immediate situation, though of course the voice actor's delivery also deserves praise here. Speaking of the immediate situation though, the last point I want to make about this set of lines is how it represents another shift in Alfred's character voice from the fanatic to the exultant. The Japanese uses a lot of repetitive exclamations throughout these lines, and while there are still remnants of archaic formulations and polite speech, this is also the most we've ever seen Alfred use the plain form. As usual, the official translation does a great job following suit, with lots of short declarative exclamations and the occasional turn of phrase like stirring up trouble. I'm also a big fan of the variation used for smashed and pounded and grounded, rather than crushed, 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 especially because that final grounded is technically incorrect and Alfred's been so well spoken up to now that it really sells his going a bit mad here. Overall, I'm really impressed with how all this was handled. But it wasn't just the shift in character and the sheer violence that was surprising about this scene. Alfred was also wearing a pretty strange looking helmet. Why don't we see what that was about? Golden Ardeo, the strange helmet of the squad of executioners once led by Martyr Ligarius. That gold-colored pyramid, bearing the name of Brilliance and Ardor, is a symbol of the squad of executioners, and is a thing meant to show a determined resolve towards impurity and a golden will. Martyr Ligarius said this, Good and evil are in no way related to wisdom and folly. Therefore, we alone should simply be good. Now, as you may have noticed, the first and last sets of lines on this item match the phrasing used at the beginning and end of other pieces of executioner attire. And this, together with Alfred's donning of the helm in Annalise's throne room, helps identify the piece as part of the complete set. It also contains some new information, though, which makes its discovery work as part of the revelation about Alfred's true nature. Furthermore, the translation choices involved in these new pieces of information are quite interesting. Actually, one of the decisions I'm most struck by here was the choice to not translate part of this helmet's name to English. Similar to the term mensis, ardeo appears to have a particular set of meanings in Latin, and the translators have once again made the choice to simply identify and use the Latin term rather than come up with a translation from that language. This approach provides a few benefits. For one thing, as we saw with the school of mensis, this can preserve a set of double meanings and references tied to the original term that might not otherwise come through. For another, it means that English-speaking players will likely be as baffled as to the meaning of the term as Japanese-speaking players, providing an equivalent experience to each. The downside is that the significance of the term is likely to go over many players' heads. I know I, for one, thought for a while that an Ardeo was some unusual type of hat that I'd never heard of. Ultimately, though, I think leaving the term in Latin was the smarter choice, especially when the word's various meanings are considered. 
According to an online Latin dictionary, ardeo has six different senses, including being in love, being on fire, shining, and being in a rage. As a symbol of the executioners, then, I think it's fitting that it could at once be taken as a representation of zeal and shining light, at least as they see it, and the passionate fury with which they confront their foes. But speaking of symbolism, there's another interesting choice I see in the official translation of the central portion of the Goldardeo's description, because it seems to combine all of the helmet's metaphorical significance, whereas the Japanese differentiates things a bit more. It does this by using a couple of modifiers for the word that, clearly meant to be a reference to the Goldardeo itself, and then specifying this same word as the subject of the sentence. In other words, the Japanese first describes the Goldardeo, then goes on to say what it symbolizes. Why is this important? Well, it seems to me that included in this description is a kind of definition for the otherwise puzzling term Ardeo in the item name. In Japanese, the relevant phrase is Kagayaki to Netsubo no Naomotsu, where Naomotsu means to bear the name, Kagayaki means brightness, glow, or shine, and Netsubo refers to a deep longing. The latter two concepts both line up well with some of the senses for the Latin term Ardeo I mentioned earlier. And when you add in the idea that this item bears the name of these qualities, I think it becomes clear that this short phrase is meant to be an explanation of that specific term. You can see a reflection of this in my more literal version, which begins, That gold-colored pyramid, bearing the name of brilliance and ardor, is a symbol of the squad of executioners. Here I've even used the word ardor as a way of expressing the concept of burning passion specifically to recall the titular term ardeo. In the official version, though, this is all reduced to the first couple of qualities the item is said to represent, luminosity and ambition. So, while the official translation still gets across everything the Gold Ardeo symbolizes, it's less specific about these first two qualities being part of the meaning of its name, which is potentially important because it alters player experience. Remember how earlier I was saying that English-speaking players and Japanese-speaking players were both likely to be baffled by the Latin used in the item name? Well, while that remains true of the name itself, it turns out that if they read the description, Japanese-speaking players will have a better appreciation for why the item has that name and what it means compared to English-speaking players. While this is less than ideal, though, I suspect this phrasing was arrived at in part because of practical limitations. You may have noticed that this item description is quite lengthy, and on top of that, it involves repeated text from other pieces of the Executioner set that really can't be shortened. This places some pretty firm limits on how many lines this central part of the description can take up, and the official translation stretches the full description to 11 lines of text, which seems to be the maximum. So if we accept that the limits were too tight to include all the information from the Japanese, then I think keeping what the item symbolizes while dropping the connection to its name was a smart choice. There are times as a translator when you simply have to choose what information to preserve, and identifying what's more important to keep is a valuable skill. Thankfully, though, not every executioner item involves such decisions, certainly not this weapon. Wheel of Ligarius, weapon of the squad of executioners once led by Martyr Ligarius, used to beat and crush the impure blood clan of Canehurst. Drenched in a great deal of their blood, it is now vividly clad in their hatred. If that hatred is released by activating the wheel contraption, its wonderful true nature is sure to be revealed. I have to say, I really like the translation of this description, because I think it does a great job of capturing the spirit of the original. For example, take the central set of lines. Literally, the Japanese places a greater emphasis on the beating and crushing action of the weapon, while the official translation focuses more on the implied slaughter this crushing resulted in. And while I can see an argument to be made here that using a verb like crush calls to mind the blunt nature of the weapon, I like how the wild implication of the word slaughter contrasts with the more controlled name of executioners this group has taken for themselves. In particular, I think this works well with the brutal nature of the next line in the official English, bathed in pools of their blood and forever steeped in their ire. Furthermore, while we're focusing on verbs, I want to point out what an incredible choice I think steeped is, with its implications of soaking something in a liquid. This helps connect the now entrenched ire of the vile bloods with the blood the wheel was drenched in, an important lore point. It's also an idea that leads us to the final set of lines, where the core meaning of the Japanese is presented in a much more straightforward way. 
This is perhaps best demonstrated by looking at my more literal translation. If that hatred is released by activating the wheel contraption, its wonderful true nature is sure to be revealed. What's the ultimate meaning of this? That transforming the weapon will release the hatred of the vile bloods the wheel has been imbued with in a demonstration of the true nature of the weapon. The official version, transform to release the power of the wheel and manifest their lingering rage in a show of utter brilliance, gets at these same ideas. Activating the wheel contraption is the same action as transforming the weapon. Releasing the power of the wheel implies you can see its true potential, and obviously manifesting the lingering rage of the vile bloods is meant to get at the idea that their hatred is released in the transformation. This revelatory act is also described as a show of utter brilliance, which functions as a way of keeping up the positive tone of the original, works as a reference to the shining brilliance the executioners identify with, and hints at the visual effects tied to the weapon's transformed mode. The line works on many levels, which really drives home how well done I find the translation of this whole description. As we stand over Alfred's dead body, though, I did want to briefly point out a few things about the conclusion of his questline. First, note what he decided to do upon the completion of his hunt. He chose to give up his life. This has always been a somewhat confusing aspect of his story, but I think there's another potential parallel with our character to be found here, though we won't really see it for a while. In any case, following Alfred's demise, we were able to receive a rune from him, which brings me to the other thing I wanted to mention. One of the effects of this rune is that it marks us as a hunter of vile bloods in online play, and it can only be obtained after Alfred's death, provided we help him reach Annalise first. In other words, we can choose to take up his legacy after he's gone, similar to how he himself followed in the footsteps of Ligarius. In a game that's very much concerned with inheritance and the lingering will of the dead, I find that quite fitting. It also brings me to one last point I want to make about Ligarius' wheel and a connection it has to the Executioner's Gloves in Japanese. You may recall from episode 44 of Translation Born that there's an aspect of the Executioner's Gloves that wasn't included in the official translation. A literal version of the relevant portion might be, These gloves, which must have been drenched in a great deal of blood, are now the dwelling place of countless vengeful spirits. If that sounds familiar, that's because I deliberately worded this to emphasize how the Japanese uses the exact same phrase when describing how both Ligarius's wheel and the Executioner's gloves were drenched in a great deal of blood. Furthermore, there's some similarity in the Japanese used to characterize the vengeful spirits that dwell in the Executioner's gloves and the hatred that the Ligarius's wheel is steeped in. Both terms begin with the kanji for grudge, though the gloves follow this with a character for spirit or ghost, while the wheel goes on to use one that means thought or wish. The important thing, though, is that both of these items, which got coated in vast amounts of blood, have now been imbued with the ability to channel the wrath of the slain into an attack, reinforcing the idea that the will of the dead lingers in blood. I think there's even a bit of irony at work here, because remember that despite their confusing name, the Executioner's Gloves are not affiliated with Ligarius' squad of Executioners. They're gloves that once belonged to someone who held the post of Executioner in a distant land, and which then fell into the possession of the nobles of Canehurst, who used to delight in watching the mad dances of the vengeful spirits the gloves could produce. Well, now it's the lingering hatred of those very nobles that has been imbued into the Ligarius's wheel, because it absorbed so much of their blood. Unfortunately, this connection doesn't come through in the official English, because this part of the Executioner's Gloves isn't translated, probably due to character limitations. Honestly, I think this is a good example of how tricky it can be to translate a game like Bloodborne, because in the context of each of these items alone, all the translation choices make sense to me. In the context of every other description in the game, though, it's harder to see what small pieces might be important. Anyway, that's all for this episode. As always, let me know if you have any feedback for me, and until next time, thanks for watching, everyone.